yeah, thanks so much for hosting me. I think this is cool. I also really like the Menti at the start because now I kind of know what people are, you know, what the background is. Um, okay, so I'm kind of hoping that you'll ask questions during my talk. So just send them in the chat and I have it open here on the side. Um, so yeah, I'm Fonts. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. I live in Berlin and I work part-time at the Julia lab at MIT, um, where I work on visualization basically. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about Pluto. Pluto is a notebook environment for Julia. And let me just jump straight in. Uh, we are on a mission to make scientific computing more accessible and more fun. And today, accessible will kind of mean reusable, reproducible, easy for people to install and to run your code. And with fun, I'm going to mean visual. I'm going to mean JavaScript because I think JavaScript is really fun. Um, so Pluto is a notebook environment just like Jupyter or Observable or R Markdown, if you've used those before except it's only for Julia and it's made in Julia for Julia. Um, and we have a couple of key values. So one really big thing in Pluto is uh, interactivity. Interactivity is built in from day one. It's not an extension that you have to install. It is our core principle. We want everything to be as interactive as possible. So the main example is here on the left. Um, I have one cell where I'm defining a matrix A. That's a little two by two matrix. And you see that as I'm typing in um, different values for the entries of A, the second cell, which is using A to integrate an ODE with those coefficients, it updates automatically. And this is just like how in Excel, you have a cell that depends on another cell. So in Excel spreadsheets, and when you change the first cell, the second cell instantly updates. And this was this genius invention from the 70s, I believe, um, which I think was maybe the smartest idea in computer science. And it meant that uh, hundreds of millions of people know how to program out of nowhere. People were literally buying computers because they wanted to start programming in Excel. That's crazy. We need to get back to these days where everyone is excited about programming, right? Then the second thing with interactivity is that, so we're interactive through code. You can change code to interactively play with your, with your model. Second thing is that we also have widgets. We have sliders, buttons, or more advanced things. Um, and those can directly link into a Julia variable. So in this case, I'm saying, my Julia variable X is bound to this slider. And then here I'm using X, like X, X times two, X times 10. And you see that it updates while I'm moving my slider. This is really easy. People learn this like instantly when they start using Pluto and they use it all the time. Uh, second big thing for us is reusability, reproducibility. Um, and we have this ideal that things should be reproducible by default. Computers are super smart. So let's use these super smart computers to do the right thing by default instead of the quick and easy, dirty thing. Um, yeah, and then we use Julia, um, but I won't talk about that because there is kind of other, other talks about this. And then it is designed for education. Um, my background is in, so in terms of software, my background is in game development and web apps. So I like making things that are visual and flashy and available to everyone. Um, in terms of science, I'm a mathematician and I did some physics. <clears throat> um, and I really, a big project for me was my bachelor thesis where I had this model that I wanted to visualize, but it was in Python and I needed JavaScript and this link was hard to make. And then I have a background in education, uh, some teaching assistant stuff, but the most interesting was that I 
try to teach programming to children between seven and 18 years old. So for different ages, we had different uh, programming environments. And here's one of my favorites on the right. Um, it's a little robot that follows the line that you draw. And by drawing a different line, you're basically writing a different script. You're writing a different program. And apparently a seven-year-old can learn how to program in five minutes. So why are we being so difficult? I even have this nice quote <clears throat> um, from this amazing podcast, highly recommend, write this down, um, with Jonathan Edwards. Um, those of us who are good at abstraction are the ones that flourish in programming, yet even we don't have the power enough to pull it off. We're constantly failing and making mistakes and unable to comprehend what it is that we've just done. If we could only just minimize this intense intellectual burden of programming, then regular people would be able to do it, but we would also be able to do more. Um, yeah, let me show what Pluto looks like. And then from that point on, kind of see what I mean. So a Pluto notebook consists of cells and they have codes with computations like one plus one. And I can create variables like hello, it's one, two, three. I should make it clean notebook. <clears throat> so one plus one. Um, and then there's hello. And I can use variables in other cells. And then a big thing is this literate programming. So in any cell, I can create markdown and say my title, look at my cool report. And then I can hide the code of any cell to kind of make it more presentable, make it look more like a final document that I would want to send to people. Because this publishing is also a big part in Pluto. <clears throat> And so the reactivity that I was showing before is when I change hello and I run this, then Pluto will also rerun this other cell. So it's called reactivity. Um, and so it's nice for this type of interactive exploring, but it also has some really nice benefits. Um, and I'll show you this very cool notebook. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of, so I'll quickly scroll through it. It's kind of an article, right? You see no code basically until the very end, but all of this is backed by code. And when you're reading this article online, then you can look at any cell and see what's going on there. And you can change things. Um, and it's very interactive. So it's about global CO2 emissions during the next two centuries and then how it affects our global temperature going from 1.3 above sea, which we have now until crisis. Um, and you see that when you can move this around and this is the type of interactivity that you can do with Pluto. So I can change this graph at the top <clears throat> and then instantly see the things that depend on it. So this graph depends on the CO2 emissions. So it automatically updates, as well as this uh, cost control damage benefit thing. Uh, this is for an American audience. So there's like the bottom line in US dollars. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, I wanted to show one, one thing that, that I used to face a lot in Jupiter, like a reproducibility issue, which is renaming variables. So for example, I have this variable called colors, which defines kind of the theme colors that I'm using in this document. And if I would rename this to, I don't know, colors with a capital C, um, in, okay, I already had colors with a capital C, colors two, what would happen in Jupiter is that the variable colors is still defined in my kernel. So, uh, so of course the notebook would not be run because it's not reactive, but I could keep using the variable colors in my notebook 
without knowing that it doesn't even exist anymore in my code. So then when I send my notebook to someone else and they run it, it's not going to work. Even though on my computer, it looked like it worked, which is another kind of reproducibility issue. Like if your computer tells you that it works, but it actually doesn't, um, then that's a reproducibility issue. And this is one that we <clears throat> also fixed in by introducing reactivity. So um, yeah, I'm getting a lot of errors now because colors is not defined and I'm using colors everywhere. Let's see. Yeah, so for example, here it says colors not defined. And then when I change my definition back, it's all fine. Where am I? And so now everything works again. And so the idea is that the results you see on the screen are uniquely defined by the code that you see on your screen, which is not guaranteed in Jupyter, but we try to make this a guarantee in Pluto. Um, if you want to know how this works, this reactivity, because it's something that we had to add on top of Jupyter. Uh, we had a conference last year called PlutoCon, which was about Pluto. And there was a talk called the backstage of reactivity, which explains how all of this works. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and I quickly wanted to show this publishing. So here is a website, for example. So for Pluto, all notebooks can also become websites and they can stay interactive. So um, <clears throat> here I have a picture of Philip, which is the dog of my professor. And then it's interactive on the website. So this is our course. And the idea is that the students of our course, which could be from the internet, can just go to our website and interact with our um, computational material. And again, all of this has to be backed by this reusability, interactivity. They can even click here and run the entire notebook either locally by downloading it or through Binder. And in that case, it will launch a Binder kernel in the background. You can go to mybinder.org if you don't know what Binder is. It's this really nice free service. Um, all right, first question, what's the computational cost of the reactivity and can it be turned off? That's a great question, which took us two years to answer. Um, <clears throat> so the computational cost is, it does not rerun the entire notebook. Like it, it's not doing, you know, run all cells whenever you do anything. So when I do a sleep one in this cell, you see that this cell took one second to run, but it's not rerunning because it's unrelated. So we have a topological graph of your notebook and we traverse the graph. Um, so that's kind of the first obvious thing. Then the computational cost, um, it's always on the order of, so it's on the order of milliseconds. So we try to do everything within the blink of one eye is kind of our rule, but it doesn't affect your code. So if you write a for loop and you want that for loop to be fast, uh, it will be fast because within your cells, we don't do anything. We only do things across cells. So your code is as fast as Julia can be. Um, it's only like this reactivity across cells. Now, of course, the reactivity algorithm is written in Julia. So it's extremely fast. Um, I take that for Jupyter Python it would need to be implemented at the kernel level, or well, this is probably implemented at the server level. Um, for kernel, do you mean Jupyter kernel? Yeah. Um, yeah, so for Python, you can either make, just like Pluto is not related to Right, so Pluto is not a Jupyter kernel. It's like a whole new thing. It doesn't implement a kernel and you could do exactly the same for Python. Um, there was an experiment to do a reactive Python kernel for Jupyter. Um, 
but it didn't work out all the way because so something we found is that it's really nice to develop this front end so the the ide the website together with the back end together with the language like to have it be a single thing and we can make choices that only work for julia and i'll give a good example about this in a bit um, so i personally think that making a new notebook system for specifically for one language and doing that properly can lead to a better result whereas jupyter has this ability to let you use all different programming languages in one environment so i see it as a trade-off where right? jupyter will let you use all your programming languages whereas things like r markdown observable pluto uh, and more kind of can narrow down on the best experience for that one language um, I hope I answered your question. All right. All right, let me talk about reproducibility because um, I was thinking like, why would people in this audience want to listen to me? It's a high performance computing audience, whereas Pluto is not generally developed for the HPC crowds, but rather it becomes this part of Julia itself and it's best for like a notebook doing some data analysis and visualization. So the two things I thought is for me personally, it's given me this really interesting perspective on scientific computing and on Julia kind of through looking like through Pluto I got an interesting perspective on this wider ecosystem and also on kind of the JavaScript Julia combination. Um, and the second thing is that maybe you could actually use it yourself. Um, that's, that's up to you. All right, so reproducibility, I think is a problem that everyone in this group understands um if you do a bit of scientific computing work but you cannot reproduce it later and you cannot visualize it very well then did you even do it at all right so reproducibility is very important i think and it's also just one of these things that it's hard for people to join our programming community um but reproducibility could solve that right if people would just read a nice article online and instantly run it and change code then maybe they're more inclined to stay with scientific computing so there's two things that we really improve or three things one is hidden states the thing i talked about before uh, second is the package environment and the third one is executable outputs um, so really quickly hidden state means we don't want you to have to do reset kernel and run all. That's something I used to do all the time in Jupyter, like restart kernel run all, just to check that it all works. You don't need to do that because we have analyzed whether you need to do that or not. There are some situations where we think you should restart the kernel and then we give you the button and a warning, like don't share this notebook with anyone until you did a restart, but that rarely happens. Most of the time we can use activity to to solve these problems package environment um yeah we we have this thing where um pluto automatically installs packages it stores the package environment in the notebook and when you open someone else's notebook it automatically does all the packages correctly and i'll say more about this later and then executable outputs is the goal that um if you see a notebook that was written in Pluto, you should be able to run it. So we try to put binder inside of notebook files in a way. Um, let's talk about the package environment. So um, this is actually something that Abel already talked about, which is great. And there was this slide, which demonstrates perfectly how you're supposed to do this. So normally you start up Julia, 
then you activate the package manager. And then this is really good. You activate a temporary environment because Julia is extremely well optimized for having hundreds of tiny environments on your computer, unlike PIP, where this is kind of a pitfall or a Node.js where you have these massive node folders. In Julia, um, other packages are installed globally. So you can make hundreds of environments if you want to. And you add packages um, and then you do your stuff. Um, and so with Pluto, um, the idea is that we automatically install all packages that you use. So I can, for example, using autocomplete, I can find all packages that exist. And let's do forward diff. And you see that we put this little bubble inside of your code. And it says forward diff will be installed in the notebook when you run the cell. So when we run the cell, um, it quickly installed it. And it's now ready to use. And I copied the code. So we have this function f. And then we do the gradients. <clears throat> so I can now continue importing any package that I want. I could import plots or um, Pluto UI, which is this interactive library, or CUDA, or anything like this. Something I wanted to show is like a typical way of making this interactive. So I also do the Hessian and then I'll make this a variable, the initial points. And now you see that it's already interactive just by changing this variable, right? Um, but something that a lot of people like to do is um, get a package like Pluto UI. Um, and now you get interactive elements that you can use elsewhere in your code. So now I kind of have the X and Y components be these numbers that I can drag around. And I can also put these next to each other. Um, yeah, and you can go on and on like this. Um, but one thing I'll show here is, so this notebook file, um, I'm gonna open it in VS Code so that you see the colors and it looks a bit nicer. No, thank you. So you see here's your code and something that we actually did was because you defined in it X after you used it, we actually put it before because we know that if you want to run this notebook file without Pluto, it needs to run before. So we reorder your cells in the notebook file just to make sure that it can run even without Pluto. Uh, and all Pluto notebook files are designed to run as a Julia script. So everything that Pluto needs to know um, is a Julia comment. So we have these special comments to keep track of which code is where. And then something else is we have directly in the notebook file, we have the project TOML and the manifest TOML. So you see, um, I imported two packages, right, for a different Pluto UI. It automatically added those, a complete entry, and then there's a manifest. And then when someone else opens this notebook, we create a folder, we put those files in, we activate it, and then we have about three or four like common pitfalls that we automatically detect and fix because we really want notebooks to work. This is like one of our main qualities that notebooks work, that Pluto installs. And um, yeah. I'll do a, I have this nice live demo that I recorded before. Well, on the right, I'm editing a notebook. And then on the left, you see the notebook file <clears throat> and it's hot reloading. So you see that if I type one plus one, it shows up as a cell. 
And then once I import this package, it creates those things. And then I can just continue adding more packages. Like I just added JSON, automatically gets added. And then here I added dates, gets added to the environment. And then I remove it again. And then it also gets removed automatically. So you never have to worry about this again. <clears throat> and then sometimes we detect a situation where we cannot recover and we want you to restart the kernel. And then there's a button for you to do it. All right, so that's reproducibility. It's um, no hidden state, which means no state-based reproducibility problems. Package environments, Julia has an amazing package manager, and then Pluto just gives you a GUI, a graphical interface for this. And then executable outputs means that whenever I export a notebook as an HTML file to send to my students or my friends or whatever, <clears throat> um, this is what they'll see when they open the HTML file. So you see this just downloads, uh, this is my file. And then there's this button baked into every HTML file, which is edit or run. <clears throat> and then you can either, again, launch a binder within this session, or I can download the notebook out of it. So every HTML file has this latent feature where if you wanted to, it can be an executable document. It's always, it's built in. Um, yeah, I think because of the time, I'll skip a bit about visualization, which would be about the combination of JavaScript and Julia. But I'll quickly say that when you install Pluto, um, you can go to the main menu, and then there's this notebook, Pluto and the web, about all the ways that you can use JavaScript and Julia together. Um, and a cool demo is, for example, this one, vtk.js. You can just import that and use it. Or... Um, there's this one. This is a scatter plot with a million points. And you can zoom in and you can zoom out. <clears throat> and this is also just importing a JavaScript package that's really good at scatter plots with a million points. And then I plug in data. So this is JavaScript. And I can just interpolate Julia data directly into it. So here I'm giving the coordinates and the color. Um, yeah, that was it. Um, give Pluto a try. It's really easy to install. And um, get in touch. Thanks. Yeah, amazing fonts. Really nice examples. Judging by the positive comments, I, I feel others say the same thing. There, there's a question on computational intensive cells. If it's not oh, going to yeah. bog down the, the notebook. I think that was maybe also asked before, but I didn't answer it completely. So this is the thing that took quite a while for us to figure out because we really want this reactivity to always be on. And we don't want to have a button in the top right to turn it off temporarily because then, you know, we're back at kind of day one where we have all of these state issues. Um, so the solution was that we can now disable cells. Um, so, okay, let's say that we say amount is how many seconds we want to sleep. And then if I change this to two, it takes me two seconds to run this. And I can also, Right, so the feature is I can disable the cell. And then now when I change it, it doesn't rerun reactively until I enable it again. Um, but the nice thing here is that we use this topological graph that we have. So um, 
say that for amounts we do hello times two. Then changing hello will also cause a sleep, but we can disable hello. And now you see that these cells are indirectly disabled. So it says this cell depends on the disabled cell. So now when I change this one, it doesn't run and it doesn't run anything that depends on it. So now you have a bit of manual control over this while still using reactivity smartness. This was actually an open source contribution. I forgot to say, but Pluto is open source, it's free, um, which also meant that we got some really nice contributions from people with really different angles. Uh, and this was a great example. Okay, um, a question from my side. At SURF, we have the, the Jupyter Hub service, which is set up by Kaspar, who's here in the chat as well. Um, and it, it's used a lot for education where you have like 50 or 100 students that all need to work on a specific Jupyter notebook for doing exercises while using a GPU, for example. Um, because the Jupyter notebook is very low level entry to using those kinds of infrastructure. Is that something that Pluto is being used for? Do you know? Yeah, so um, Pluto can be one of your apps on Jupyter Hub. So Jupyter Hub is this second generation system. And besides built-in Jupyter, they also allow apps like R Markdown. And Pluto can be one of the apps. And we have one school that set it up for their students where students have access to Julia Hub and then through, through there, they, they launched Pluto. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 